already somewhere. Hello? This, uh, Uh, on it, maybe is this one? This one? Let's say, yeah, it's ah, excellent. Sure. Recording in progress. Hello, uh, this is Paolo, Paolo Zanari from uh, USC, University of Southern California in Los Angeles. And of course, I want to first uh, thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here today. Even though my talk doesn't necessarily fit the main focus of the conference, so I guess this is something uh, different today. Uh, you know, you get one of those talks for every conference that is completely out of place, and that's me today. So what I want to be talking today, uh, oops. I want to see the other people, see. Okay, so the key word of this uh, conference is so far, well, very aptly as uh, quantum annealing. Today we're going to be talking about something different that is quantum scrambling. So let me start, and this is work done uh, at USC over the pandemic, and I'm gonna share with you at least the initial part of that. We have a bunch of papers, and I'm gonna be focusing on, on the first one of them. And let me start as a way of introduction to, um, well, tell you what the setup of my problem is. So, well, it's pretty much everybody else set up. I got a quantum many body systems with finite dimensional local Hilbert spaces. And of course, you can think of your favorite spin chains or lattice model, and so on and so forth. So a bunch of the subsystems. And the goal of the talk is to relate and to uh, sort of argue that they form a unified uh, framework, three, differently, uh, three, di uh, three different concepts that seemingly are related namely the, the scrambling, and I'm going to define one of them, each one of them later on momentarily, is quantum scrambling, operator entanglement, namely operator at the operator space level, and entangling power. Let me start to define what I mean very loosely and possibly lousily, what is information scrambling here. So uh, I just read that. A many-body quantum state psi is called scrambled, if the reduced state of all subsystems of size that k is larger than half of the system size is nearly maximally entangled, or maximally mixed, I should say, apologies. And uh, accordingly, a quantum dynamics, a unitary quantum process, so this talk here is going to be about unitary evolution, no open systems. Uh, well, we, we dealt with the open system case later on, but for today, we're going to be focusing on some quantum dynamics, U of t, uh, generated by some local Hamiltonian, say, and I'm, say uh, uh, and I'm saying that this is performing quantum scrambling or quantum information scrambling if for uh, many or almost all simple enough initial states, for example, you can think of product states or low entanglement states, after some initial transient period, uh, the time evolved state is approximately scrambled. The idea is that you got a multipartite quantum system and say you got a subsystem A over here and you encode information, say a bit of information by some local process. And then you let the system dynamics unfold over time and information starts to get delocalized. The information initially localized over here leaks all over the place. And after a little while, uh, uh, you're uh, unable to tell the two different bits, the two different encodings apart, unless you're able to perform a large a measurement, namely involving a set of qubits or, or subsystem that is larger than half of the system size. Okay, so we say that information is lost. This is relevant to scenarios like the well, quantum information uh, paradox in black holes and in general in many body in many body system. Okay, let's keep going. 
And the way people, well, there are different ways, of course, of thinking about this process here, the quantum information scrambling process. But usually, at least over the last few years, people uh, working in the field, uh, they typically characterize uh, the scrambling in terms of the growth of the strength of the commutators or the decay of some uh, out-of-time order correlators known as OTOX. Let me define those for you. So this is my, uh, do I have actually a pointer? Well, I guess, whoops, okay, doesn't matter. So you got this quantity here. Uh, do, do I actually, okay, I have it. I have this quantity here. So V and W are two local operators. You want to think of V being an operator localized at time t equals zero in sub subsystem A, say over here, and, and, and W being localized in some other subsystem at a time t equals zero because they have disjoint supports, they, uh, they commute. But as soon as the, uh, time unfolds, time goes by, then this guy over here, VT, evolves according to Heisenberg picture, and the, and the support of this operator grows accordingly until it hits, it overlaps uh, with the support of the operator W, and from this point on, operators are no longer commuting. This is really the idea that the commutators uh, uh, encodes for this delocalization of information. And once you expand out uh, this expression here, this, by the way, this is just the two norm, so it's the Hilbert-Schmidt norm, there will be lots of operators norms here, uh, for this commutator here. And once you expand this out, if you assume that V and W are unitary observables, then you have a simplification. You get to one minus this object here. That is a four-point correlation function, W, V, T, W, dagger, V, T, dagger. And this is precisely what is known as an out-of-time order correlation function. This is the OTOC. The idea is that when time goes by, uh, uh, the scrambling is, is, is measured by the growth of this commutator here. It was initially zero and then starts growing. Or uh, uh, similarly, uh, by the decay of this out of order of the OTOC over here. So roughly speaking, uh, we can use this quantity here to characterize different levels or, or, or scrambling powers of different types or families of Hamiltonians. And if you will, on the, on the left-hand side here, we'll, here I say is low, I probably should say weak scrambling. You, you, you may have models that are integrable, and by that I mean either free fermions models or beta ansatz or localized model, like the Anderson model or even many-body localization, many-body localized Hamiltonians. They, are, they have low scrambling abilities, and then as soon as you move uh, rightward, you get stuff that is still uh, local, that is uh, in the chaotic family, you, know, you, you got some quantum chaos going on, and I'm going to show a few examples of that, like the transverse field Ising model, uh, uh, some specific form of that, of the XXZ model with next neighbor uh, couplings. And, and if you keep going to the right with a stronger scrambling ability, you have systems that are better described or might be described in terms of random matrix theory, random matrix theory and they're highly known local operators like SYK model, if you guys know what I'm talking about, and is an all-to-all uh, coupling uh, model of random couplings between Majorana fermions, and eventually you get stuff like the, 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 uh, the Gaussian unitary ensemble over here. So this is the idea, that the larger this quantity here, uh, the more uh, I should be able to tell apart these different classes of operators, or I should say of quantum dynamics. Okay, so let me ask, uh, Try to be a bit more precise here concerning our setup. Uh, the idea is that I got a bipartite Hilbert space. H is the tensor product of H sub A and H sub B, being H sub A and H sub B, the Hilbert spaces of the subsystem A and the subsystem B. And the subsystem B is supposed to be the complementary system here. And I start off with a couple of operators, uh, VA that is localized in A and an operator WB that is localized in B. And uh, in order to have a quantity, so what I have defined so far, the uh, commutator or the OTOC, is something that depends both on the dynamics and the particular choice of the observable. And in order to have something that depends just on the dynamics, uh, allows me to uh, study that, I want to get rid of the dependence of the choice uh, of, the, of the operator VA and WB. In order to do that, of course, you may, uh, you may go down different paths, the way we decided to do, following Yen et al. Uh, from the Wojciech Zurich Group at Los Alamos National Lab, we considered the uh, average OTOC, the bipartite average OTOC, namely we are going to perform an average HAR 
uniform average over all possible unitaries, VA and WB localized in A and B respectively. And, uh, and, and the good thing is that, well, well, and the good thing is that you can actually perform analytically this average here. Well, this wasn't done in that paper. In that paper, they went through a whole bunch of a standard, more or less standard approximation, weak coupling, Markov, and stuff, and they draw a few interesting conclusions. But we, what we found out during the pandemic is that, well, actually, my student, Yorgos Stiliaris, that you can, if you sit down long enough uh, and you have some familiarity how to perform hard group averages, you can indeed find a closed analytical formula for that. And this is the first result I wanna share, I wanna share with you guys. And it's this formula here. And it's a beautiful formula, as you would agree, right away. And uh, it contains just information about uh, the dynamics. But let me tell you what the other ingredients in there are. So this has been published in this paper here on which this uh, present talk is based. So basically, you got to move from your Hilbert space to a doubled version of your Hilbert space. And so you got subsystem A, subsystem B, and then you got another copy here, system A prime and system B prime. And what uh, as A, A prime does is a swap operator between the subsystem A and A prime, leaving B and B prime alone. And uh, perhaps, well, perhaps I say this, since this is in my slide, uh, uh, just in case you were wondering, we are performing averages, and we certainly achieved the goal of getting rid of the dependence on the initial choice of V and W, but you may still wonder whether this is representative of anything. Well, in fact, as it turns out, this formula uh, for, uh, in, in this problem here, you get measure concentration phenomena, namely if you are in sufficiently high dimension, then basically this average here is very, very representative of the whole ensemble, namely with very high, the probability that you were to pick randomly V and W and find a result that is different uh, from this is exponentially suppressed. Okay, so we got typicality going on over here. Uh, but let me try uh, uh, to make this formula that, uh, uh, a little clearer, and they say that a uh, picture is worth a thousand words, and uh, probably, I guess, 10,000 equations. So let me draw a picture of that. For those of you like um, a quantum circuits, so th this is what it is. So my expression here, my bipartite average otok is given by one minus one over d squared, the trace of this operator here that depends, given by this quantum circuit here that depends on you. And basically you got the two copies of the system here. You first apply or you enact the unitary process U on both copies. Then you swap A and A prime. Then you enact uh, the inverse unitary process U dagger and U dagger on both uh, two, on the both on the two copies, and then you swap stuff again. This, over, this is a quantum circuit. There's a unitary quantum operator. The trace of this operator here that you may think of measuring using standard uh, quantum computing tricks is precisely uh, my quantity. Okay, so we are focusing on the trace of this operator here that contains this average bipartite otok. Okay, so you can measure that in principle. There's a little start over here because it means that in practice, in principle, uh, namely for me as a theorist, this is going to be pretty easy, but in practice, of course, this is going to be extremely challenging since really what we are interested in here is many body quantum systems. Okay. Good. So now I want to introduce the other two uh, concepts that ultimately I want to relate to quantum scrambling as measured by the bipartite OTUC. And this is are uh, the notions of quantum entanglement, operator entanglement, and entangling power. Of course, we are all used to the notion of uh, quantum entanglement at the state level. And well, uh, as it turns out, and it's not hard to see, that as soon as you have a bipartite quantum system, namely who is Hilbert space, is a tensor product of two copies, then necessarily even the operator algebra on top of it, namely the space of operators, is a bipartite uh, a Hilbert space as well. As we know, you know, the operator algebra of a tensor product is a tensor product of the operator algebras. And so very much as you do with uh, quantum state, you can ask yourself what is the entanglement of an operator in operator space as an element of this bipartite Hilbert-Schmidt space, if you will. And this is what I'd done uh, years ago. And the way you do it is, of course, the very same way. You mimic entirely what you do at the uh, state level. 
namely uh, you got the Schmidt decomposition for the bipartite state, and here you got the operator Schmidt decomposition for the operator, the bipartite operator, and you can write the corresponding Schmidt decomposition here in terms of a basis, a bi-orthogonal basis of unitary operators fulfilling this normalization conditions here, and you get the usual set of Schmidt coefficients that now they just, you know, you got this, uh, uh, many more of them because these are actually in operator space, so you got this square of them, but they're still nice non-negative numbers, the, the lambda j, they form a probability distribution. Once you have a probability distribution, then you're one step away to define entanglement measures or entanglement monotones, because once you have this uh, operator Schmidt coefficients, then you can define operator entanglement. Of course, there are many ways. Basically, any measure of uniformity over the probability distribution would do it for you. And for Neumann, uh, excuse me, uh, Shannon entropy being being the main uh, the main character there. But uh, if you want to, and this is very highbrow kind of approach, you can uh, prove nice quantum information theorems and stuff. But if you want to get stuff done, namely you want to perform calculations, you probably be better a little humbler, and we are humble people here. So what we do, we pick the linear entropy. The, whoops, is missing a square here. So it's one minus basically the Euclidean norm of the probability vector. It's one minus the purity. Okay, and this is a good uh, operator uh, entanglement monotone, and the first result is that, quite surprisingly, I have to say, that this OTOC that people have been talking for, for a long time, or at least for a few years, in scrambling, turns out to be ex the bipartite OTOC is exactly the operator entanglement of the unitary. So really, this notion of OTOC and scrambling can be mapped onto the, uh, I would say, the fundamental and fairly intuitive, I would argue, notion of how much entanglement you have in the operator space for your quantum dynamics. So this first result, G of T, my uh, main object here, my main guy, uh, uh, the protagonist of this talk, if you will, is just operator entanglement. If you pick as a uh, entanglement measure, uh, the purity of this operator here. Okay, you guys happy? Okay. Well, here we don't take we don't take uh, questions during the talk. I wonder whether this is an absolute policy or. Well, Ch Mr. Chairman, is it? Sure, I mean, if, if I don't know, the here. local people may have. Anyways, if you want to, let's say that if that's allowed by the law, and you want to ask a question in the middle of the talk, I'm happy to try to answer. I can't promise a good answer though. Okay, so let's now move to the next uh, character. Uh, I always think of this as movies. We are from Hollywood, after all. And, uh, and, and the next notion I want to connect to the former ones is the notion of entangling power. And it again is a fairly intuitive idea. So if you want to quantify the ability of a quantum dynamics to uh, uh, produce, to generate entanglement, there's a very simple idea there. Namely, you start off from some product state, you have a bipartite situation, system A, system B, you prepare a product state, and then you evolve the system uh, according to the unitary U, and then you see how much entanglement you have generated for this particular initial product state. And in order to get something that does not depend on the particular choice of the initial state, of course, we're going to do it again. We're going to perform an average, a uniform hard average over all possible initial states. And if you do that, well, you get this quantity here that I call the entangling power. Of, well, it's one way, of course, if you pick other, you, can, uh, you have the freedom. This is the entanglement measurement there, okay? And again, I'm going to pick in order to get stuff done. I'm going to pick my favorite uh, linear entropy quantity, namely this one here with, with the square over here. And this is a measure of how much entanglement as measured by linear entropy of the reduced density matrix you produce acting upon product state. You say this is a very intuitive measure and, so it, and, and has been introduced uh, many years ago. Fortunately, uh, by myself and the late Chris Zolka and Lara Fauro back in 2000. And, well, even back then, we realized that there's a straightforward, well, not entirely so, but I would say a rather interesting uh, 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 relation between the entangling power, namely average, repeating myself, the average ability of a, of a, of a quantum process, a unitary quantum process to produce entanglement starting off from product state uh, with entanglement of the operator entanglement. This was pretty much the only uh, a connection I could find back in the day between operator and entanglement. It, it seemed to be a very natural notion to have, uh, but 
I wasn't sure what this was trying to tell us. And well, you got this relation here. So if you were wondering what is the relation between operator entanglement and entangling power, well, look this formula here. Uh, forget about the prefactor that any alpha large system dimension D is basically one. And for a bipartite symmetric uh, per bipartition, namely you got two sy subsystems with the same size, then entangling power defined by this formula here is connected to the OTOC or the operator entanglement is simply this uh, linear combination here of the OTOC or the operator entanglement of UT plus the operator entanglement of UT where you pre-process the information using the swap between the two subsystems minus the, uh, minus basically the operator and entanglement of the swap itself that turns out to be a maximally entangled operator. So basically there's this very simple relation. And in fact, if as it happens for, ma for most of the random unitaries, the, uh, the and operator entanglement of U of T of your quantum process and the uh, operator entanglement of UT as AB, namely the same pre-processed by the swap, for most of, uh, of those random operators, these two terms here are actually very similar, in fact, identical. And so you can say that in that situation, the entangling power and the operator entanglement are proportional quantities. So knowing one, you know the other. In general case, you would have just to use, once you have the operator entanglement, in order to know how the, uh, the entangling power, you would have to use this formula. Again, let me use a picture and to show some physics. Whoops. Hmm? Okay, so let me, so this is graph. So uh, the x-axis is actually time, and I'm plotting the, operate, the entangling power of the dynamics as a function of time for different models. Wait. Doesn't go away. The, the bar here doesn't go away. Anyways, doesn't matter. So you see, you have, Different curves with different colors. The black one uh, is kind of cheating. This is really a random a, 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 a Gaussian uh, a, a unitary uh, Gaussian from the GUE ensemble, and it has maximal entangling power, as you may have guessed right away. And there's the blue line. The blue line is a chaotic uh, uh, transverse field Heising model over here, where both the transverse X field and the, tr and the longitudinal Z field are different from zero. This model is known to be chaotic. And you see is entangling power after the tra some uh, short transient over here. It gets nearly maximal. It, it basically becomes indistinguishable from the GUE to the chaotic Hamiltonian. On the other hand, if you consider an integrable model, say, for example, the uh, same uh, Ising model with just say h equals zero, uh, then you get the green curve over here. And you see there are two uh, main differences. The first, the long time average, and we, have, we will have more to say about those uh, momentarily, uh, is lower, so you don't have as much as entangling power as you have with the chaotic one, quite intuitively, I would argue. And, uh, and, and the fluctuations, and the temporal fluctuations, the variance of the temporal fluctuations. Can you guys hear me well? Okay, so I don't have to do this. No, let's not do that. Okay, very good. So uh, this is integrable. The green line is integrable. And it's, yes, yeah, fair, fairly high, fairly high entangling power, but still quite, you can tell that apart from uh, the, both the chaotic and the, and, the, and, the, and the GUE ensemble. And then I got another couple of examples here that are clearly w way below that in terms of their entangling power. And this is MBL model, is basically this model down here where you randomly select uh, this uh, transverse coupling here. They're drawn from some uniform dist uh, distribution in some uh, range. And this model here is known to be uh, metabolically localized. And, and in fact, if you set uh, H to zero, you get uh, uh, basically something that is, uh, can be mapped in a uh, one-body problem and is basically Anderson localization. So you see that the localized models are very easily detected just in terms of their behavior, uh, of their entangling power behavior. Okay, so, one. Okay, long time average. Oh, perhaps I go back to say, actually, this is an interesting point here. I believe. So one could think, and I thought that too, that indeed uh, the entangling power is, could be a great measure to tell apart these different classes of Hamiltonians, uh, even over a short time, even the transit. You may think that you have a, uh, well, 
if you have a chaotic model as opposed to a localized model, even the, the growth of entanglement for small t should be different, right? Short time behavior. Well, it turns out that at least using entangling power, this is not the case. As you can actually see that both the integrable, is clearly the green integrable, and the blue chaotic uh, uh, Ising model, they had the very same slope at the beginning. The very same slope. So if I were just to focus on the initial growth of the commutator I would, or, or the entangling power, for what matters, I would see exactly the same thing. And this is because basically these two models, they share, given the bipartition, they got the same interaction terms. And in the same interaction terms, they basically is what tells you what is the slope of the, of the growth for short time. But the long time behavior should be different, right? So this is what this graph, I think, is trying to tell us. If you average over time, if you wait long enough, uh, you see, you can tell them very easily apart. And this is precisely what I'm going to do next, basically focusing on long time averages. Okay, as I said, the short uh, time growth cannot distinguish chaotic and integrable model in lattice systems. This is, wouldn't be true for continuous variable systems. Okay? For continuous variable system, people in the chaos community have seen that the growth is indeed different depending whether your system is chaotic or is integrable. Uh, but this is not the case for lattice systems or discrete systems. And so now we're going to be focusing on infinite or long time behavior. Uh, we got a little problem here. It's a standard one with a standard solution. Uh, let me tell you what that is. Of course, these are finite dimensional systems. Whatever observable you are, be, are you studying, you're, be, you're focusing on, is going to be a quasi periodic function in time, is a sum of basically of complex oscillating uh, exponential, and is never converging to anything. You can't just take the limit for t going to infinity because you're going to have, well, that limit will not exist. You will have recurrences, and eventually, if you are patient enough to wait until the, uh, the Poincaré recurrence time, it will go all the way back to the initial signal. So in order to uh, get uh, overcome this difficulty here, of course, the answer is a standard. What you're going to do, you take time averages of this uh, object here. This is the infinite time average of this. And what I'm trying to do next is to compute this time average under some mild assumption that are generically fulfilled in many body systems and to see whether, well, what is this is trying to tell me? Well, as you can guess, uh, this can be done. So if you assume this generic uh, mild assumption I'm going to make uh, about the spectrum of the Hamiltonian is called the no resonance condition. And in short, this just says the energy levels end the energy gaps, namely the differences between the different energy levels, are non-degenerate. Of course, this is generically true. Degeneracy is symmetry. As soon as you add a perturbation, you're going to break this symmetry. You're going to split those levels. So this is generically fulfilled. Of course, many generically doesn't mean there's lots of systems that are very interesting that do not fulfill this. Okay, But if we have one of those, you do a little perturbation. That is what all happens anyways in real systems. and and. Ba-bum, you get the NRC, the non resonant condition. And if you do that, and you write down the spectral resolution for your Hamiltonian this way, being this, the phi sub k, the eigenstates, the projections over the eigenstates, uh, and the EK, the, the spectrum, and you define the reduced density matrix for each of the eigenstates. So rho k is the reduced density matrix over, say, subsystem A or subsystem B. Chi here is a label that stands for either A or B. Then you find the following formula, this one here. OK, you may say, so what? Well, first, there's a nice thing about this formula here that is indeed, well, is indeed a fully analytical rigorous result. It's a little theorem, if you will. And this is uh, 1 minus, well, the time average under the NRC, the non-resonance condition of the operator entanglement. And it's in terms of this matrices here. It doesn't really matter that you try to understand the details of this. But the point is that these matrices here are, are basically just the encoding our Gram-Schmidt matrices, namely our matrices made out of scalar products between these reduced density matrices associated to each of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And the thing is that this object here does contain global information about the uh, entanglement, the state entanglement structure across the full system of eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Basically, inside here, secretly, and in fact, not even so secretly, you know, basically, you know how much entanglement the, the, the 
eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, all of them, this is an infinite temperature thing, if you will, all of them, how much entanglement you have in there, okay? Let me show how this works. Okay, so, whoops, there's a funny symbol there. There's a question mark there. Okay, let's, let's uh, keep it simple and let's consider an hypothetical model such that, so let's say, let's pick the bipartition, dA equal dB equal size subsystems, and so their dimension is the square root of the total dimension, and let's say that you got L qubits, so that this dA is two to the L over two, and let's assume all the eigenstates of your Hamiltonian are indeed maximally entangled. And if this is so, then you sit down a little bit and you stare at the equation I've shown you before, and you can actually find this very simple result over here. So basically, the infinite time average of the, of the, uh, of the operator entanglement, or the OTOC, the bipartite average OTOC, is 1 minus 1 over D. And if you expand this out, well, this is just a, a square, and you see that it's exponentially close, in fact, in the system dimension, in the, in the system size, to the maximal possible operator entanglement that you have. And if you take the average of the log of this quantity here, this basically is just uh, this quantity here is the purity, is the operator purity. Remember that the operator entanglement is 1 minus the purity, so 1 minus g is just the operator purity. And, and, and you put a minus sign there in order to have a positive quantity. This is the two Rainy operator entanglement entropy of the system. Then in this assumption here, if all your system eigenstates are maximally entangled, it turns out that this scales, and this is again, is a, well, this is a lower bound, but it's pretty tight. And uh, you can show that this is scales extensively, okay? Maximally entangled eigenstates across the full spectrum. And then you're like, okay, this sounds like a very strong assumption there. Well, first, it's not really, because even uh, local systems, they may have low entanglement states, but those are, you know, the low part of the spectrum and maybe the very high end of the spectrum. But most of the bulk of the eigenstates of any local Hamiltonian is going to be maximally entangled. I should say nearly maximally entangled. Okay, but nevertheless, uh, good point. Let's see what happens if I, uh, I make up another model trying to disentangle the different contribution to this object where all the eigenstates are product. I still assume the spectrum is sufficiently complex, namely that NRC assumption holds true, but let's say that your system is, well, okay, here are a few more things. Of course, if they're not exactly maximally entangled, they are like a psilon away from being maximally entangled. You have this nice bound here, so things are robust. Uh, uh, so if, it, you know, if they're close to that, even your result is going to be close to that you know, using this upper bound here. But let me uh, focus uh, on this system uh, of this hypothetical quantum antibody system where all the eigenstates are indeed products. It's kind of the other extreme case, and let's see what happens there. Okay, here, okay, you see that. You can go through the math and you find ex an exact formula. You have to sit down. It's, it's not a trivial calculation. It's not even hard. You sit down and you find this formula. Now it's 1 minus 1 over square root of the. So now if you were to compute the average operator entanglement, Rainy entropy, then you see that the scaling is still is still extensive in the system size, but there's a prefactor, a very neat prefactor. Namely, if all your eigenstates are product states, or say, low entanglement eigenstates, then it turns out that is as if you had half of the qubits in the system from the lenses of the operator entanglement. So the scaling is L over here is one half over L. So this is very neat uh, distinction, separation between this, this different type of models. Of course, both maximally entangled eigenstates, all of them, or all of them being product, is a kind of is a kind of a joke, right? Isn't it? So we want to look how this uh, what happens when you take a realistic model, and by realistic I mean realistic for a theorist like myself, namely one of those spin chains. Okay, let's see. Hopefully, this is what is the next slide. Okay, the next slide is probably. The most important of the talk, but anyway, time, are you keeping track of the time? I know there's a lunch, so as you see, I'm hurrying up, I'm going very fast. Ten more minutes, can't slow down. I can't slow down, and so I, I want to tell you about this. So let's now consider the same models, and the Eisenberg is the uh, uh, transverse fielding Ising model, the, the basically the same guys we had before, and it's chaotic if G and b both the fields 
are different from zero. Then I got the MBL, the many body localized models, where this, the coefficients of the transverse X field are random. Uh, and then, well, and then again, here's my model, the, the, the fake model, the fake Hamiltonian, where all the eigenstates are, are declared to be product states. Okay, really, you have to think of something with low entanglement, really, there. And uh, let's see what happens. So now I'm plotting, I'm plotting basically the log of the purity. If you will, this is just the negative of the Rennie entropy. And again, we remarkably, I would say astoundingly, uh, at least this is what we thought, uh, this simple prediction of these two extreme cases, the L and the one half L, seems to be exactly reproduced by these objects here. So you see this is the slope, okay, let me do this. This is the slope for the integrable models, including the localized ones that are in some sense uh, integrable, uh, as people here know all too well, for example, the many body localized state is characterized by the existence of an extensive number of quasi local integral of motion or quasi integral of motion. And uh, uh, whereas down here, where the slope is steeper, we got the chaotic, the chaotic uh, uh, models and, and, the, and, and, the, and the random matrix model here. So again, this quantity here. The long time behavior of this quantity is very, very clearly distinguishing, sort of like an order parameter like behavior in terms of the prefactor or the scaling of, of, as a function of the system size. Because, of course, here again, maybe we don't see that. Well, of course, this is the system size. So, this is like 14 qubits. This is as far as we could go in terms of this uh, to illustrate our results. But it's very clear. It's very clear. Integrable and localized models, they fall with, uh, uh, with, a slower slope, with, with a smaller slope, and there's the chaotic one with the steeper slopes. Very same, look, the prefactor one and prefactor one off in the scaling of the operator entanglement. Okay, so this is a, a pretty neat result that I wanted to share with you, and since it seems like I have a few more minutes left, if that's the case. Maybe, yeah. Right. Sure, I, oh, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and if you do uh, you, well, I guess you can since you say so. And uh, yeah, 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 of course. You mean just the variance, just the variance of the distribution? Yeah. I would. This is okay. Here, I. Okay, here, of course, I don't have the specifics of the numerics that, of course, have been right, performed. Taken down the sufficiently that you are confident. This, this, this is exactly what Namit Anand, my student, did. Uh, but, uh, so you're saying, was your, were, please. I believe you, I should see a crossover. Uh, Actually, Antonella, that's a great point. And it, yeah, because I said all the parameters, because that sounds, sounds cool, right, doesn't it? It's what we really want to have in these situations. Uh, whether it's really all the parameter, uh, Professor Skardik is telling me, okay, why you don't try to make uh, something out of your claim, the hand waving, and you just change the strength of the random fluctuations, and you should tune from a many body localized, but very large variance, to a, a, a chaotic model with small variance. And let's see. How the slope goes, it has exactly this behavior, like from one to one off. Next, next conference, or, or I'll, I'll send an email to my student right now. They're very, very good point. Uh, we'll try to do that. Victor. Uh, no, 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 this, this uh, good point. You see, is GR of beta, there's lots of notation there because this is from one of the other papers. This is really, is one minus G. Is the, lo is the log of the purity, is minus the, the guy had the scaling, so yeah, sure. Is the, the purity, right? Operator entanglement grows, namely the purity. The operator purity is the king with the system size and what I'm trying to tell you, to convince you guys, and, well, and this should make it, that, uh, well, uh, the scaling with the system dimension is different depending whether you are chaotic in which class you are. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. Good point. I, I should change this. 
notation. I see a question in the chat. I'm afraid if I click this, I won't be able to go back. We do not hear. Yeah, uh, actually, I wrote it and I wanted to ask a question. Please. Because we do not, uh, we do not hear the question because the uh, oh, question is on yeah. hearing the mic. It's a good point. So, uh, Th thank you for bringing this up. So you see, I disrupted <laughs> the rules and there's a price to pay. Well, um, uh, I uh, I was constant because I was um, personally working on this kind of uh, things uh, pr at this moment and writing this paper that we are going to write. I did not really understand uh, when uh, you considered um, with the time as as the time is increasing, the entanglement for the Anderson localized system is like Wrigley, but when it is many body localized, it is uh, it is quite steady in the long time limit. Uh, can you please comment on that? Well, I'm not sure whether, okay, let, whoops. Okay, There's a few slides back. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Okay, bum, bum, bum. I, I'm not sure I can say anything intelligent about this. You mean, the, uh, and, well, he's all, no, he's here, right? Uh, the go, next, this, next. this one? Yeah, yeah. Look. I see, and this is exactly uh, a feature of integrable models, they're more wiggly. So I would, I don't know the answer, it's a good point. I don't have the answer from the top of my head. You see, this is not just the only difference because even the, the average, the value is higher, and so it's just the average value, as well as the variance of the signal is different from the MBL and the Anderson. And in general, uh, integrable model, real integrable models is a, is a generic feature of those. When you plot those quantities, you see very wiggly stuff. And of course, we could go into there. But yeah, good point. Not sure. Not sure. By the way, this is the entangling power. And really, uh, it's not the main focus of, of, of this work here that is about operator entanglement auto. But uh, uh, good point. Good point. Thanks for the comment. Uh, another, I actually have also one more question. Please. Because this is an answer we are trying to find as well. Maybe you know this already. Which is, uh, you, are, um, you are presenting uh, this uh, talk about this entangling power of different gates or different operators. How does it uh, relate to the quantum and leading schedule? Oh, I, uh, very good question. This would have been the way I would have made my, my talk coherent, or at least somewhat coherent uh, with the rest of the conference. And I talked a little bit about it. And in fact, I think perhaps back in the day, even Daniel and I considered briefly to, to go into that or, uh, but I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. The adiabatic schedule is indeed a, you know, a good unitary evolution. And, uh, and I should be able to apply all the tools and the ideas that I've been sharing with you guys today to that. Uh, whether we gonna find something interesting about it, I think for me is an open question. So it's, a, it's a, your question, but it's also my question. And, and again, perhaps next talk or next conference. Thanks a lot for, for bringing this up. It's a good point. I don't, I don't know. Maybe you have an idea you wanna share with us? I do. Uh, maybe I will talk to you about this over lunch. Oh, so you are in this room? I will be. <laughs> oh, wow, that's <laughs> nice. Okay. I thought it was somewhere in some different time zone or possibly another planet. No, no, I'm just here. <laughs> uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> well, maybe I, I consumed my time. Look, I have another pretty awesome section, but in the interest of time and lunch time, especially, this makes it more important. I'll, I'll, I'll just maybe entropy production. Okay. The summary here, and I'll take some more questions. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Dimitri. Yes, I have the following basic question. So there was this formula for unitary circuit, the very first one. Oh, you want me okay. to go all the way back? Yes, okay, now going back to the history, why people were thinking about you want this? right right this one yeah. people were thinking about okay it was some formula in time 
you were showing how they correlate the behaves in time with two unitary operators and two swap operators. Yes. I mean, oh, you want this one? Yes, this what one, exactly. What we call the fundamental formula. Okay, good, yeah, exactly. So what was fundamental about discovery of Stanford and Maldasena that they were telling to us that there is a maximal Lyapunov exponent, how this correlator may grow. And then SYK model is just one example of such system where this bound is saturated. So now question to this unitary quantum circuits, is it known what are the bound? And is it known that, for example, your example saturates such bound or so, so the, the bound, the Maldacena plus other people bound yeah, is about sure. the, the growth, right? Is the, the time growth. derivative. Temporal, temporal behavior. So you subtract temporal off. Temporal behavior, uh, it is the rate of growth. As I said, uh, here, this is a fairly different setup. There is like continuous variables or even quantum field theory. And, uh, and the quantity is slightly different. So certainly we have bounds for this. But if you look the time behavior, actually, it's exactly this. So thank you for bringing this up. Um, let, let me real quick try to go here. No, all right. Bear with me. I'll be right there. So it's a very good point. So you see, basically, the, I'm, back, I, I'm going back to a comment that I made earlier on, but let me do that again because I think it's relevant to your own question. So the growth, the, for, for continuous variable system or quantum fields, you have this, well, you can have uh, the diverging, you have Lyapunov exponents, and basically this allows you to, for this quantity here. And this would, in this case, amount to be focusing on the short time behavior. But for this uh, lattice discrete model, and for this particular version of the OTOC, right, this is a bipartite, uh, average OTOC, so it's, it's in this big family, it's not necessarily, though it's quite related to the, uh, the one you have in mind. Uh, for this model here, the short time behavior, it is not able to tell chaotic and integrable system apart. So it's a weakness of the model. This is why, and we can sit down and show the formula. Actually, I found a very nice formula. I was very excited about that. And then my students said, okay, it's a great formula. This exactly shows that there's nothing we can say in this case here because it depends just on the boundary, and you can have a model that's chaotic, but when you look at the boundary between the two subsystems, they got exactly the same interaction. And what this slope here is telling the strength of this interaction here. So we are powerless. So there's no, we don't have that type of result. This is why we went to the long time averages, where indeed we have this very nice, neat scaling telling the two different categories of many body systems apart. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Hi. So uh, my question is related to that uh, plot of uh, entangling entangling power with spin chain. Oh. Okay. And. So entangling power. Uh, yeah, yeah, this one. Entangling power. So, uh, as you said, the plot for integrable and chaotic was almost of the same order. I was wondering... For fixed system dimension, they do. The one, before you say, let me say that. First, the long time average is clearly different. You can, you know, you eyeball this and you see, you can tell them apart. It's same order, though. And, uh, and there's, it's more wiggly. Well, it's more wiggly because it's lower, so you can fluctuate up. But if you take the long time average, the scaling is very different as a system size grows. So this is where you can tell them apart. Just staring at this, I wouldn't bet my life. I may perhaps bet somebody else's life, but you see what I mean? There's a... yeah, so, but please. The, the question was that how these curves change with system size. That's basically oh, one of my yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, basically all the other plots are, are about that, right? So if you take the long time average of the, well, first, this is the entangling power. Most of the talk was focusing on a slightly different yet connected quantity, this operator entanglement, OTOC. But you can say that in, in some circumstances they are proportional to each other. And well, if you take the time, long time average of this and the chaotic, then you see that when, when the system size grows, well, they have different scaling behaviors. That, that's the answer to your question. Do the long time average, plot it for different 
system sizes, and you can tell them apart. There's a clear separation. Okay, and yeah, the, they look the same. Well, they don't really look the same. And the second question I have is that, uh, are there any sort of restrictions on the type of operator which you use? I mean, for example, operators which do not satisfy ETH or something like that? No, no. They, no. So good question. So, I mean, uh, of course, if you were to plot different operators, and again, this is what most of the stock is going to, it was about, you will have different results, and this is why we believe this is useful and interesting. But per se, thank you for allowing me to say it again, the fundamental formula, if you allow me to be uh, kidding here, this one here, there's no assumption whatsoever about the nature of the unitary. In fact, it doesn't have to be generated by any local Hamiltonian. It's just you. This is a group theoretic result. So no, there's no restriction. Once you apply to different models, you find different results, and this is what we believe makes this interesting. Okay, thanks. Any other question? At the risk of putting you on the spot, just trying to connect it to the conference. Oh, you uh, want to connect me to the conference? I'm very excited. So if, if, you, if you take you to be the adiabatic intertwiner, any, any intuition as to what might happen? Look, the honest answer or, or, or what? Both. Well, excuse me? Speculative answer. Oh, speculative answer. Oh, it's going to be extremely interesting. <laughs> and it will solve many of the problems you guys are unable to solve, and more seriously, that's the... the but let, let me make it more specific. I don't know, because is... I don't know. I've been thinking about it. Actually, I had a plan, because I felt so guilty being invited to give a talk that didn't fit in the conference. Uh, well, we had a bunch of other... Do you think that and the, I tried the entangling to answer power... this before the conference. And I realized that this is a program for one of my students. So I don't know, Daniel. Frankly. Do you think the entangling power of the adiabatic intertwining okay, would be good. higher this or lower good. than that of a generic unitary? I think the long time is this one. In fact, thank you for reminding me uh, you know, of, of this paper that I had like embarrassingly many years ago with your postdoc, Alyosha, and we exactly studied the entangling power of adiabatic evolutions. This is not what we are, this is about, this is about entangling, entanglement, operator entanglement. But on the other hand, because of that formula connecting the two concepts, I may be able to answer partially your question if I, if I just could remember what we found back then. But I was like, you don't want to know how many years ago. Okay, I have Good a point, thank you. Okay, I have another uh, very technical question. So on, and they were on, simple Hamiltonians, so it's not the kind of many body stuff you guys are doing here. So for that, I would do numerics. In fact, we could do numerics with the, our master equation. Because, but or maybe I say this. I get, uh, this is the first of a series of papers, a trilogy, or maybe there's four of them by now, and published on different journals and stuff. And we have been extending this to open quantum systems to general quantum channels, and, uh, and even uh, more speculatively, to a different notion of a subsystem, virtual subsystems defined by subalgebras of observables. And most of this extends very nicely to that, uh, even theoretically, mathematically, right? Uh, when it comes to adiabatic evolution, the intertwiner, I don't think there's much we can say other than going to Simulations. So, I, I, we can sit down there. I talk. Okay. Uh, could you go to slide six, the operator entanglement, <laughs> what is operator entanglement and entangling power? Uh, yeah. This one. Yeah, so there's this curious formula at the bottom where you relate the entangling power to the OTOC. Well, yeah. this is curious. So the question I have is, uh, is there any intuition for why this, uh, the OTOC for the swap operator is being subtracted? Why? Why does it appear with a, a negative sign? Intuition, no. I would say it comes out 
rather straightforwardly from the calculation? In fact, look, this, no. Intuitive? No. I, I, do I? Well, let me show this, though. It must be there. OK, maybe this makes it for you. Because the entangling power of a swap, look, you got a product state and a swap mode. But again, it's still a product, right? So it's a zero entangling power in this simple-minded working class approach that is the entangling power. So you see, so now plug it in here. This is G, G of SAB. Then you have G of SAB times itself, namely the G of the uh, identity that, again, is a product operator. So this guy here is going to be 0. So they must cancel out. So I, I can say more sophisticated thing. This is a group average, a Z2 group average, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to go to the ma mathematical physics side of my work because I think this is uh, alien enough. But yes, is that? has to be there. Not, wasn't there, it would have be a mistake. So I will try to rescue organizers and relate your talk to quantum computing. So let us take a system of two-dimensional system, not one-dimensional system, but the one which you can describe by topological field theory with non-abelian anions. Okay, then there is this classical result by Kitaev and Preskill that entropy, entanglement entropy is proportional to L plus, plus correction proportional to number of non-abelian anions. So question to you. First of all, probably it will be power one. Yeah, it looks like integrable system. Oh. What's the question really? So if you take, for example, system with non-abelian anions, two-dimensional, like with Ising or with Fibonacci, and apply your technique, so, what you will see but, from your ent okay. classical entanglement entropy is L minus correction proportional to number of anions. So what you will see probably, so what would be a That's a claim about the ground state entanglement, about the uh, so-called topological entanglement entropy. Actually, it cannot help that to say that Preskill and Kitaya, they found this very nice result. But in fact, we were the first to find a weak approach. the Kitaya and the ground state of the Kitaya. Hello, could you please use the microphone? Otherwise, people in Zoom cannot yeah. hear. Sorry the about that, guys. I will, uh, OK, maybe I won't be bragging anymore. So I know very well that result because I found it first. Uh, but that's a ground state result for ground state. Here is operator entanglement. So. On the face of it, I, I don't know whether I would see anything like that because it's not a state property the, of the ground state. This is a property, as all the formulae I've been showing to you, involving the full system of eigenstates. If you will, this is an infinite temperature result, if you want to phrase it that way. So I don't expect to see the topological entanglement entropy that I happen to love very much for above-mentioned reasons. Any more question? If not, I just have one question. Maybe uh, it is related to previous. Not question. lunch yet. These operators, these are, uh, I mean, are local operators, or it has to be? Well, the, 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 the formula is very general, can be whatever. And indeed, we have used that for GUE that are not certainly not local. But then all the graphs I've shown are operator, the entanglement, the evolution has been generated by local Hamiltonians. In fact, one dimensional spin chains. Okay, so yes, they are local in this sense. They are generated by local Hamiltonians. So uh, let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you.